blessed to have a pre the praise team that we do, and thank you for their commitment. Well, take out your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. A very familiar passage to a lot of people there at the end of Matthew chapter 20. In fact, the end of Matthew's gospel, those last several verses of Matthew chapter 28. We're continuing to look, as we have been for the last several weeks, at, at how the Bible describes the church. The terms, the words, the names the Bible uses to describe the church. And today we come to this familiar passage, uh, this passage that we often refer to as the Great Commission. And we come to another term for the church, and that is disciples. Now think about it. When we describe ourselves as followers of Christ, what is the most common term that we use? Christians. Right? That's how we describe ourselves most often. And it's an appropriate term. It's an appropriate title. People from America are called Americans. People from Italy are called Italians. Creatures from Mars are called Martians. Christians, for those of Christ, are called Christians. It's an appropriate term for us to refer to ourselves. But here's the interesting thing. That when the New Testament describes the followers of Jesus... It uses that term, Christians, it uses it only three times. And in fact, of those three times, only one of them, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, that's the only place a Christian is referring to other followers of Christ as a Christian. The most used term, the most commonly used term in the, the New Testament to describe followers of Jesus is the term disciple. In fact, that word is used 261 times to describe the followers of Jesus. So if we're going to take a look at the church, we're going to look at what the Bible calls the church, those that are following Christ, we have to take a look at this word disciple. We can't not look at it. And this morning, I want us to look at the Great Commission, maybe a little bit differently than I might have looked at it before and that we might have spent time in it. Usually when I preach through a passage, I have three points in a poem. I kind of joke about that, sort of the Baptist way of doing things, three points in a poem. And all of those points usually are alliterated so that you can remember them. It makes it easier for you to remember. I'm not going to do it that way this morning. <gasps> I know, do the Baptists know about that? Is that okay that we do that? We'll veer from that a little bit. What I want us to do this morning is I want us to hear the Great Commission the way the disciples would have heard it. On that hill that day, how would they have heard it? Now, not in Aramaic. I'm not going to preach the whole sermon in Aramaic this morning. But I want, us to, I want us to hear it the way they would have heard it, experience it a little bit the way they would have experienced it. We're going to go verse by verse through it and just kind of hear what they heard as they stood there that day. Now, let me get us in the scene. Let me describe the mindset a little bit. These are in the days following the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus. There's a 40-day period from his resurrection to his ascension there in Acts chapter 1 that we read about Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he gives those last words to his followers. This happens, the Great Commission happens somewhere in that 40-day period. Now, if I had to describe the mindset of the disciples at that point in time, I think the word that I would use would be disoriented. They were a little disoriented. There was, they intellectually, they knew the crucifixion was coming. But knowing something like that's going to happen and experiencing it are often very, two, two very different things in our lives. They knew it was coming up, but still when, when the crucifixion happened, they were rattled by that. That really shook them to the core. And then they were just starting to process that. And within a couple of days, people are coming back and they're starting to tell them, Jesus is alive. And they say, I saw him die. What do you mean He's alive. And they're just now they're starting to wrap their heads around that. That evening, he appears to them, to 10 of them. Eight days later, he appears to all 11 of them. And I think these things are happening in such rapid succession. So many changes, so many big things happening at once. They're just having a hard time, I think, wrapping their brains around what's going on. I think disoriented would maybe be an understatement of the mindset they were in, especially as they stood on this hillside in Galilee this day, and they heard what Jesus had to say to them. And so what I think Jesus is doing in the Great Commission is I think he's reorienting them to his task for them. They knew when he, when he walked the earth, they knew what his task was for them. They followed him, they walked with him, he said, here, go into those towns and preach the gospel and heal the sick. They knew what his task was. But now in this, in this time of disorientation, I think they're starting to maybe lose a little bit of sight. He's reorienting them to what his task for them is. And he's assuring them he's still involved. 
There was no question when he stood next to them. They came back to report what happened. You sent us out. and Demons even responded to us. And they came back and interacted. There was no doubt then he was still involved. But now then the question, is he still? And so he's reorienting them to their task. And then, and then he's assuring them he's still involved. And so I want us to eat the elephant of the Great Commission one bite at a time. And I want us to hear it the way they heard it and experience it the way they would have experienced it. I'll start there, verses 16 and 17. Now, verses 16 and 17 are not really part of what we would formally call the Great Commission, but I think it helps us experience a little bit of what they did on the hillside that day. Verse 16 of Matthew chapter 28. But then the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Now, we don't know what mountain Jesus designated. He told them, apparently, that after he was crucified, after he was resurrected, he said, go on to Galilee. He told them the place he would meet them. We're not privy to that conversation. They knew where that was, and they proceeded to that place. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Now, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, he said, sometime in that 40-day 40, 40 span... From Jesus' resurrection to his ascension, at some point in time, in that period of time, Jesus appeared to 500 believers at one time. And there are only two places that could have happened. That could have happened here on the hillside outside of Galilee when he gave the Great Commission. It could have happened on the Mount of Olives that, that time in Acts chapter 1 when he gave those final commands and he ascended back into heaven. Those are the only two areas big enough for 500 people to gather at one time. Now, I'm convinced it's here. I'm convinced it's here when he gives the Great Commission. And I mentioned that last time I preached through this passage. Of course, this is not the first time I've preached through the Great Commission. And last time I preached that, I mentioned that, that I believe it's, it's there on that hillside outside of Galilee that he, that he gave this to the 500 believers. And, and after, the, after the message, sometime during that week, one of the guys in the congregation sat down with him. He said, I don't, I don't think that's where it happened, Adam. We had a good discussion about what he thought and why I thought it happened there outside of Galilee. And by the way, if I say something, you say, you know, Pastor, I don't get that. Or I don't understand that. Or maybe I don't see that in that passage. I do encourage you. Come sit down with me. Let's talk through that. But here's part of the reason why I believe that happened here at this point. It's because of that odd little statement there in verse 17. When they, saw, when they saw him, they worshiped. But some were doubtful. Now, I find it hard to believe that it was the 11 that, that were doubtful. At, at this point, as I, as I mentioned, the, the day after, the evening he was that he was resurrected. He appeared to 10 of the disciples there in the upper room. Thomas wasn't there. And they interacted with him. You remember first they thought it was a ghost. And he interacted with them. Eight days later, he appeared to the 11. Thomas was there then. He interacted with all of them again. And then some days later, he appeared to seven of them on the Sea of Tiberias. And so by the time this happens, he has appeared to the majority of the disciples three times following his resurrection. They've interacted with him all of those times. And even the most skeptical among them, Thomas, he has become convinced that this one they've been interacting with is in fact the resurrected Jesus. And then I mentioned the spot that they went to. Now Jesus had told them after a resurrection, you go to this spot, I'll meet you on this particular mountain in Galilee. And that's exactly why they're there is to, is to meet Jesus. They've gone to the spot that he told them to go to. And then he shows up at that spot, and I can't imagine them thinking, okay, all of it we've been through. We, most of us have interacted with him three times, and we've talked with him. And then we're at the very spot that he told us to be at, and he, he shows up here, and I can't imagine the, the 11 of them standing there thinking, gosh, I wonder if that's Jesus, after all of that that they had been through. And so I find it hard to believe it was the 11 that were doubtful, so there were others that were there that day. But who cares, right? I mean, that's the big question. We read through a lot of the scriptures. So what, what does that mean to my life today? Why does it matter? And does it make any difference whether it was 11 there or 500 that day? Does it make any difference at all? I think it does. I think it makes a great deal of difference. I think it makes a great deal of difference as to how they heard the Great Commission and how you and I ought to hear it as well. See, up to that point, the primary ones that Jesus had trained the primary ones he had equipped, the primary ones he had sent, and the primary ones he had any expectation of any disciple-making to be done were the 11. 
Those were the only ones. Those are the ones that he spent all the time with. Those are the ones he poured himself into. Those were the primary ones he had any of those expectations for. And when he called them, when he called them to be followers of him, they would never again go back to what they did before full time. When he called, Pete, when he called Matthew from his tax collector booth, Matthew would never again go back to be a tax collector. And when he called Peter and Andrew, James and John, all of them were fishermen. They would never again go back to be full-time fishermen. This disciple-making thing now was their full-time gig. But now they stand there on that mountain, on that mountainside. And they interact with Jesus, and something has changed. As they, as they look around them, as they see the other 500 on the hill that day, they realize that in that crowd, there are some fishermen. And those guys are going to go back to be fishermen. And there are some farmers and merchants and bakers in that crowd, and they're going to go back to be farmers and merchants and bakers. But something is different. Not their calling, not the calling of the 11. What is different is that these guys that, that are there, these others that will hear the Great Commission, they'll go back to what they were doing, but now they'll also be disciple-makers. That's a big change. That's a, a radical shift in what has happened. In some ways, I, I think, think about the church today, and one author put it this way. He said, the church today has become a little like a football game, where we, we watch those that are on the field, and they've suited up in their, in their uniforms, and, and they're, they're conducting the plays, and they're going about the game. But then there's a lot of people around that are watching it happen. A lot of spectators cheering them on in the fans, cheering on those ones on the field that are playing the game. But he said, instead, we're all supposed to be players. We're all called to be players. I think that's what the disciples saw as they stood there on that mountainside. And they said, it's not just us 11 who have given up everything to follow Jesus. And this is all we will, our lives will be devoted to. It's not just us. Now it's everyone who's gotten this call. And this author said, we are all supposed to see ourselves as football players. We're all on the field. We, we take the playbook, and we talk about it in the huddle, and we make sure we all understand the plays. We make sure everybody understands their role in the play. And then we break the huddle, and we go out, and we get at carrying out the play. And I think as the disciples stood there, on that hillside that day, they saw that something had changed in the calling that Jesus had for his disciples. It wasn't just them. Now it was a much larger calling. And then he goes on to verse 18. And Jesus came up and he spoke to them. And he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I saw a children's craft activity that was, that was geared and aimed at the Great Commission. It wasn't one that we used. Thank God it wasn't one we used. It wasn't anything unbiblical, but it showed Jesus sort of standing there like he, was, like he was hovering on the clouds when he gave the Great Commission. And he's got his arms spread out like this, like he's making some grand proclamation. You know, like the, the heavens have opened and the sunlight is shining down and you hear the angel chorus in the background and then, behold, go and make disciples. Like that's what it looked like in the picture. But that's not at all what it sounds like, right? He came up to them and he spoke to them. It wasn't this grand proclamation with trumpets blaring and angels in the background. That's not at all what it looked like. It was, a, it was a very intimate discussion. And I can imagine that when he walked up to the disciples on that hill, that he looked every one of them directly in the eye as he said these words, go make disciples, teach them, baptize them. He looked at them, it was a very personal connection as he, as he looked at every one of them. It was not only a very personal interaction, it was a very reassuring thing. You remember, I think what he's doing here is he's reorienting them to the task that he had for them, and he looked at them all in the eyes. You go and make disciples, and you go and make disciples. And it was very reassuring for them as he, as he gave them these words particularly. All authority has been given to me. And that word authority, it means the same as our English word jurisdiction. You know, if you think about the, the legal implications of that, police or lawyers or whatever, there are certain things, they, they have jurisdiction. It means in this area, in this region, I have authority. In that area over there, I do not. 
we really like the show Blue Bloods. I don't know if you've ever seen the TV show. It's about the New York Police Department, the NYPD. And one episode here just a little while back, they were working on a series of crimes that happened in New Jersey. And they were related. They thought it was the same person that committed a series of crimes in New York. And the part of the, the tension, you know, the conflict in a show like that was they had gone over to work with the New Jersey Police Department, but they, they couldn't do anything, these NYPD officers. They couldn't do much over there. Why? Because they didn't have any jurisdiction in New Jersey. They had no authority, really, to act in New Jersey. And Jesus looks at them. And he looks them all in the eye and he very reassuringly says, I've got jurisdiction. To the, to the far corners of heaven, no matter where you might go in the far corners of heaven, guess what? I've got jurisdiction there. I've got authority there. And no matter where you go here on this earth, no matter what corner you might find yourself in, guess what? I've got authority there. I've got jurisdiction there too. Paul said in, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and verse 18, he said, all things were created through him and for him. He is the, the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Listen to this, that in everything he might be preeminent. He said, no matter where this task takes you, no matter what might happen as you leave this hillside and go carry out the task that I'm about to give you, know that I've already got authority there. Now, that may not have been something they needed that day. That might not have been something they need as they stood on that hill that day, but one day, one day they would need that reassurance. See, that was important to them. Because up to this point, where had their primary place of ministry been? Right there in Galilee, primarily. Right there in and around Galilee. That's where they were all from, most of them. That's where they were born, where they were raised. That was their hometown area. They were very comfortable in Galilee. They knew what to expect in Galilee. They knew how the people functioned and what they thought and how things took place. It was a place where they knew what to expect in and around Galilee. But as always, Jesus knew something they didn't know. That the very next thing he was going to tell them was going to have implications that was going to carry them out of their comfort zone. He was getting ready to send them in a place that wasn't comfortable that wasn't known to them, that wasn't some place where they knew how everything operated and everything functioned. This was a reminder that they were going to have to log in and pull it out later on, that I have jurisdiction. I have authority where I'm sending you to go. You remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 2. And, and I mentioned that according to tradition, Peter wrote that toward the end of his life. First and second Peter wrote those two toward the end of his life. And I mentioned that, that according to tradition, Peter was martyred in Rome. Now, Peter had not been to Rome. And as he stood on that, that hillside that day, I doubt he had thought about going to Rome, the hotbed of Christian hate. And that's not, I wasn't high on his bucket list of places to go. As he stood there, Rome was the last place he would have thought to go. But one day, the call of Christ would come to Peter. Go to Rome, Peter. Go there and make disciples. Go there and preach my message. Go there and carry light into the darkness, to Rome of all places. And when that call came, these words, I'm sure, of Jesus were ringing in Peter's ear. Go, because I go ahead of you. Go because I have authority. Go because I've already conquered what you're going to experience in Rome. And it was, it was a message they needed to hear as they were reoriented, as they were reassured of Jesus' commitment. And then he goes to what we commonly look as the meat and potatoes of the Great Commission, right? Verses 19 and 20. That's kind of where the rubber meets the road of the, the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I command you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, let me give you a little, quick little grammar quiz. I know, it's early in the morning. Grammar of all things. You may have picked this up. If you're new here, you, you'll experience this over the coming weeks. I'm a grammar nerd. I love grammar. I love to look at the sentence and figure out what's the grammar. How do these words fit together? What does that word mean in the sentence? And how is that used? I love that stuff. I'm a grammar nerd. 
I'm that kid that got A's on the grammar tests in school. That is me. I am the one that if you misuse two, two, and two, or there, there, and there on Facebook, I will call you out on it. I am a grammar nerd. Let me give you a little grammar quiz. Verse 19. What's the verb in English in verse 19? This is audience participation, so feel free to shout it out when you, when you, when you see it. Go. It's the first word, right? That's the verb in that sentence, right? Go, therefore. It's a verb. It's a, it's a, a word of action, a command. Go. That's the, the, the verb in English. And, and disciples in that sentence. Go, he said, that's the command. Disciples is a noun in that sentence. It's the result of our going. It's what we're going to do once we have gone and have done. It's the result, the end product of what we're going to accomplish. We look at that sentence in English, and go is the verb, disciples is a noun. That's not how it, how it would have sounded in the original language. They stood there on that hillside that day. That's not at all how it would have sounded. This is how it would have sounded literally as Jesus said those words. Having gone, therefore, disciple all nations. And you can hear the difference. In English, the command is go. That implies we're not currently going. That he, that he has to shoo us along. That, there's an imperative to that. Get moving. Get going. Andiamo. Let's go. There's that imperative to it. But in the original language, the going is assumed. Having gone. Since you're going anyway, while you're on your way, that's the assumption. And as I hear the words like that, I almost get the sense that Jesus didn't feel like he needed to tell them to go. That was understood they would be going. They understood that. It was, it's almost an insignificant part of what he said. Oh, by the way, while you're on your way, here's the command. Disciple the nations. That's the verb in the original language, to disciple. Now, they knew what a disciple was. Most of them knew. Most of them, they were his disciples. And it was a pretty common scene around the streets in those days. They would have seen disciples. They knew what disciples were. They saw masters walking around and their, their team of students walking behind them. They understood what a disciple was. A disciple was something that was made. As those masters walked around with those students and they poured themselves into those disciples that they had, the disciples were a little like a bucket. That master would teach those disciples, and he would explain things, and he would clarify things, and he would pour himself into them. He would model those things in front of them, and as the bucket got filled up, a disciple was made. They understood what that concept looked like, but I think Jesus' command to them that day, having gone disciple the nations, I think that changed their paradigm significantly of what his disciples were to be about. No longer a, a bucket. A disciple wasn't something to be made. It was a task to be done. He doesn't say, make this thing. He says, do this. Disciple them. They weren't buckets to collect information, to be filled up. They were more like a hose. What goes in the hose comes out of the hose. It was a pass-through. What I'm bringing into your life, what I'm imparting into you, what I'm teaching you, that's to flow through you to others. It was, they were less like a bucket, more like a hose. And it created in them a desire. I think an excitement to do this task. Elliot prayed about this earlier. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this. It created in them an excitement. God has given this task to me, of all people. We were talking in our home group this past week about the, the transformation that happened in the disciples' lives between the crucifixion and the day of Pentecost. Forty days, a month, not even a month and a half. And you remember right after the, the crucifixion, they're holed up in the upper room, the door is barred, they're scared half out of their wits. And something radical transformed them in that 40 days to when they stand there on the day of Pentecost, they throw caution to the wind and they're preaching Christ without regard for what's going to happen. There is an excitement in them now. These interactions with Jesus as he gave them this great commission contributed to this excitement. 
God has given me this, has given me this task. To make new believers, baptizing them. To help others move along in their faith, teaching them all things, to observe all things I have commanded. There was a desire and they heard his expectation. As you go along the road of life. It, that's what the having gone means. It's this along the road of life kind of discipleship. It's less sitting in the classroom and it's more walking side by side. Teaching, that's how Jesus discipled, right? He would walk up to a vineyard and he would say to his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. And every time they saw a vineyard, that thought would come to their mind, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches took a little child and put the child in his lap, and he said, unless you enter the kingdom of heaven like a child, that childlike faith, and every time they saw a child, no doubt the words of Jesus rung in their ears as they walked along the road of life. Jesus would help them connect the word of God to the things that they saw. And he, he, they heard his expectation, as you're going, do that. Connect the word of God to people's lives. Paul would say it this way in 2 Timothy 2, 2, the things that I have taught you pass along to others so that they can pass them along to others. But they also understood his expectation as they looked at the crowd. As they looked around, they, they knew he, they, he, he didn't expect everybody in that crowd to be a theological giant. He didn't expect everyone to know what they knew, to have the same experience or training or background that they had spent three years with Jesus. That's the best seminary education you can get. He didn't, he didn't expect everyone in the crowd to have that. Those fishermen that went back to be fishermen, they were going to disciple people right where they were. Those farmers and merchants, the same thing, exactly where they were in life, that was the expectation. Disciple them where you are in your life. And they also heard his promise, though. He said, lo, I will be with you always, even till the end of the age. And he said, listen, as you're going, as you're doing, as you're teaching, guess what? I'm going. And as you're teaching, I'm teaching. As you're discipling, I'm discipling. And no matter where you go and no matter where this task takes you, I'm going with you. Chuck Smidall told this story. He said, one night a master pianist gave a concert. And it was a, a formal affair, tuxedos, evening gowns all around. And a mother brought her young son. Now, he had been taking piano lessons, and she was hoping that if he saw this master play, he'd be inspired to practice. And as they sat there, as the concert hall was filling up, and he was getting fidgety, she took her eyes off him for just a minute. And he wandered up to the stage, to that beautiful grand piano that sat up there on the stage. The concert hall fell silent as he began to play the only song he knew, Chopsticks. You know, dun, 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 dun. he began to play, and, the, and the, the, the hall fell silent. People started to murmur, who is that kid? What is he doing up there? Where is his mother? The master pianist backstage saw what was happening. And he came out and he, he leaned up behind that little boy and he whispered in his ear, just keep playing. And he reached around him and he began to improvise this counter melody to chopsticks. All the while he's whispering in this young boy's ear, just keep playing, just keep going. And Swindoll says this, he said, you know, most of us hear the, the command to disciple and we feel a little like that little kid playing chopsticks in a concert hall. And all the while, though, Jesus is leaning over us, whispering in our ear, just keep going, as he's turning our meager offering into something beautiful that impacts the nations. Well, this morning, as we took a look here at the Great Commission, tried to hear it the way they would hear it, tried to experience it and understand it the way they would experience it, and my hope is that in hearing it that way, we'd ask ourselves, does my life resemble what he told them to do? Does my life resemble the commission and the command that he gave to them on that hill that day? Am I a bucket or am I a hose?
And then to ask ourselves the next question. Will you and I, will we as followers of Christ, disciples, will we step into our role as disciples who make disciples? Will you pray with me this morning? Father, what an amazing thought it is that you have called us to do this. Us. Fallen, sinful, flawed human beings aren't always as faithful to your word, aren't always as faithful in prayer as we ought to be. And yet in spite of all of that, you've called us to be your disciples. You whisper in her ear, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Just keep going. Father, I realize that there may be one here today that is not, would not, have, not be able to count themselves as a disciple of yours. They never repented of their sins, never trusted in you as Lord and Savior. Father, we, we hear about your greatness and your majesty and your goodness, even in this command. Father, I pray you would enable that one this morning. Give them the boldness to just settle that matter today. Father, for your disciples in this room, that often we think about our own walk with you and our lives resemble more a bucket than a hose. And Father, I pray you would, you would ignite in our hearts a desire to be disciples who are making disciples. And Lord, would you continue to speak to us and convict our hearts and challenge us in these next few moments in our invitation time. We pray in Jesus' name.